this stuff relaxes you. And so you can be so excited about art that you can't sleep, but after you get up at two in the morning and make what you want, then you just sleep, sleep like you were a baby with no cares in the world because the world falls away. Welcome to part two of Tracing to Understand Composition, and we're still working with this painting by Henri Rousseau. And I love it because it has great foreground, midground, and foreground, and it's totally woven together. So you can do this with this, but you can also do it with something that you find that you like. And I even have a student who has found a movie she was watching, and then she just stopped the movie, took a screenshot of that movie, and then she printed out the screenshot and she was able to do exactly what we're doing here. So there's so many places that you can get good pictures that have the foreground, the midground, the far ground, and this one has this foreground coming back onto the top of it. These trees grow up and then it makes this canopy coming around, which then goes over your head and for the viewer comes over their head and it makes kind of a nice cave-like place here. So let's get started and I found out a new thing that we can do and that new thing that we can do is right here. Um, when I was demonstrating this for my students I was using the marker pen as I did in part one but this time I have a bigger, juicier, fatter <laughs> marker pen and one of the things that you might want to do so that it doesn't get onto your own table or bleed th it's going to bleed through but you want it to bleed through onto a piece of paper that you can toss out so I've got it on top of a piece of paper and I wanted to talk to you just kind of a review and an over over side just to think about it a little bit differently and to share with you some of the things, places that my students had trouble seeing this initially. Because one of the things about all this is here in the comfort of your own home, on your own table, in your own time, you can work on something that's like a landscape like this that already has pre-configured composition, already been changed to something that's two-dimensional, that was three dimensions and it can also have this far ground area that is a little bit pixelated actually but in any case the far ground area was less distinct all of this is far ground underneath all of these branches so I'm going to suggest that one of the things you do is work with a sharpie it's this is a permanent marker sharpie with a it's a, called a super sharpie and it has a sharp point but it's a big fat sharpie and this one's real juicy because it just came out of the box so um, again I'm going to start marking on this and you're going to see that it goes through the paper here and one of the things that I've been able to do is find some of these places. So you're going to see this place here where some of my students didn't see this so they just assumed that this branch came out of this tree. Well one of the biggest devices in composition that helps us feel like um, something's coming closer to us and then something's going farther away from us is when we overlap things. So I've put the parts of this branch here uh, in and then left this intersection, shall you say, uh, of this and it's actually the bigger and a lot of times it is the bigger branch that goes in front of the smaller branch. So this branch is not coming out of this tree, it's actually originating all the way down here. It's coming from someplace down here. It might even, um, they kind of merge this branch here that comes down here kind of and it comes you can see it through the maze another one of those see through the maze type things so I'll just dot that that comes down here and this one comes down here too it 
also comes through the maze this way and then probably goes behind or right next to this big tree. So here's another intersection that the students were a little bit unclear of. And here with this going across, sometimes you can make a decision, but I can also see, in other words, I might make a decision that I want this to be in the front. But looking very, very carefully here, I see that it is in the front, so I'm gonna make these lines here that show that it goes in front of this other tree. Now this is a good place for you to notice something that is an important thing sometimes, and that is that whatever line you have, so I'm gonna show you here, whatever line you have here needs to look as if it's connected to what's on the other side of the branch. Sometimes I'll even just take that and go like that in order to really look at where I want this to look. I'm going to fix that a little bit like it goes under and lines up. A little weird over here because there's a bump underneath here, so you just want to make sure that that feels right for your viewer. Feels right that that's, this one is going underneath, underneath this bigger branch. And then I'm just going to complete up here this is one of the things you might want to do is um, be able to, and again, um, oh my gosh, this is a really hard place to figure out who's going to be, I call it who's on first, but who's going to be in front of whom. And I think here you, you almost don't have to do anything because this leaf configuration is going over the top of it. And one of the things about that leaf configuration going over the top of it is that compositionally, even though this is a skinny thing on this side, this is, there's a branch going back here and then this branch comes here and splits off. All of that again coming from this branch over here. So once I've decided this is in front of that, then I can take that that direction and it looks to me like this branch that goes at least to here goes be behind this bigger one. When in doubt the smaller ones would typically go behind the bigger ones because what's bigger in a composition. Here's another place that you just might not even see that this branch is coming across here and it doesn't have to be shown too much, but it almost seems like this tree trunk down here, again, you don't have to really worry about it, uh, that this tree trunk somehow comes across here, and maybe it even arches all the way around here, which means I might make a little note of that myself for what I'm going to do with it later. But in any case, with all of these different branches, and I, what I'm doing here is deciding this time that I'm tracing this to show you, I'm going to really focus just on the branches and then make the tracing just of the branches to start with. So here I am kind of plow, plowing through this now. And again, you just want to take your time with this because whatever you get drawn on this side is what you're going to be dealing with on the other side. But one of the things you might see here is that by doing this, I'm tracing this where I can see it the best. If you didn't have this really see-through tracing paper that I use, um, and if your tracing paper was a little bit bumpy like some of it is, some of the brands are a little bit bumpy. Now again, I want this to go in front of this, I think. Uh, I'll just take the bigger branch in front of this smaller branch. And at a certain point, these smaller branches are just the width of this Sharpie pen. And again, it really helps you to keep your drawing grip Went a little wide there. It helps you to keep your drawing grip um, intact, stay back as far as you can from the end, and um, just use these two fingers to hold the pen, and then this third finger can be a stabilizing force. This guy, as I've been telling my students, can take a vacation, 
and then from the tip of your finger to your wrist, that's good for it to be the base of it. And this finger can be touching and this end, watch it here, watch my little finger and watch with my little finger down how this moves along at the same pace and in the same curve. My little finger and the tip of the pen move together. So that's something that's really great when you're drawing. Um, maybe easier to accomplish when you're not tracing, but do get as far away from the end of your pen here as you can, oops, so that you can see where you're going. And as long as you're seeing where you're going, like you, you're not on top of it like this where you really can't see underneath it in a printing grip, but in a writing or painting grip, you're coming through here like this and you'll be able to see where you're going. Now this is also going to help you later if you should engage in a great training technique called contour drawing. And that asks you to put your pen down onto the paper and not lift it up. So you see how I make that continuous there. I just keep going with that and I'm out here on this leaf now. I might leave these branches out for right now, these little tiny ones, and I'll get them later in another tracing. Or I could, I think I'm gonna put them in. Sometimes that's one of the things that you kinda of almost have to go to tracing paper after this, which means you can't do this faster thing that we're gonna do. Um, I think it's great to go over these lines the three times that it takes when using tracing paper, but it's also fun to establish your bigger bones here, and that's what I'm going to call it with the tracing of these major portions of the composition that give it this repetitive life of all of these curves. You've got curves and reverse curves, and um, that's the way that this is woven together. One of the things that my students had trouble with is that they would see something like this and then they would um, make it straight. So some of the students that haven't gotten to the point where making both curved lines and straight lines are equally available to them. It's something you have to kind of practice that some of these lines by people who are more prone to doing straight lines, some of these lines on the tiger that I'm showing right here right now, some of these lines got kind of straightened out and that isn't a good thing because this whole composition, <laughs> the whole composition hangs on uh, getting these lines to match the way the lines are. Those are kind of straight there, but then this one starts to curve and it comes down. So this drawing right on the page like we did before, but now having a Sharpie that shows through onto the back is going to really help us out. Now on those straight and curved lines, this is, uh, let me finish the tiger here, I guess. Um, he comes like this, he has a nose like that, he comes down like this. Now here I am talking to you and using these words like nose and teeth and stuff like that and that can throw you off because you'll start to draw what you're saying. So watch that. This is a place that you're going to have to start looking carefully for what is actually happening because initially when we start to draw we haven't been seeing the finer more nuanced more subtle I guess the best word for that is subtle we're not so aware of the subtle we're aware of the things and we're not so aware of the design lines and um, okay this one I want to make sure that I get this line on the outside of these lighter inner colors of these grasses. And then I'm going to come down here and finish this tiger's stripes. And the stripes are really what shows you the tiger. That and this line behind it, but this isn't a line. Again, like I said in the part one, we are 
turning this into a line drawing and then we're going to use a line drawing to guide us as to where we're going. See this comes out in front of these lines behind here. So I want to get this guy first. So this is where we're tracing the bigger things first and then letting the smaller things that go down behind it or in this case it's the smaller thing that comes down from above and goes in front of that we're going to have those working for us later. Now again if you just say oh there's a line there you may skip some of the more, here's a good one, curved aspects of it. It's a shallow curve but it's still a curve and this is going to help with the relatedness of all things in here. Uh, again I want to go very much, I'm going on this maze here, I want to stay not so much on the line that it's that the lighter is producing but I'm staying off on the dark so that I'll have enough room to leave the light of what I'm calling this the maze. I call It's not like a, a maze that you walk through, it's like a type of type of grass uh, that grows, it's sort of like wheat I guess, this thing. The stuff, maybe it's sort of a flower, I'm not really sure what, what that is. Um, again, sometimes just turning it like this and being able to look at it from one side to another. So if this all seems too confusing, don't put it in initially. You'll have to probably come in and get it with the tracing paper later. But this way you can get your main, main bones, your main structure working for you. Now here's another place that you kind of have to take care. I would just um, have this be one line coming up here because it's too skinny to be two. And then this is a place where the size of each of these is really important and I don't mean to get tight on it but I do mean to see that this one goes behind this one that goes behind this one and so again if your mind sees leaves you're probably going to be saying leaves there you go and you're going to be making distinct leaves and some of my students made the leaves too big because they were making leaves as opposed to following this all this following this and all this tracing is going to help your hand-eye coordination and your perception and get you to start seeing in terms of the shapes of something and not so much in terms of what it actually is. This is kind of cool here. These shapes kind of end up going into being the tiger here. First they're in front of the tiger, so again it's a little bit fat down here so maybe I'll make a double line uh, down there and then bring this up here. Again we have leaves but this one just doesn't seem to, I'm not sure where it goes and when you're not sure where something goes don't try to take his painting turned into this tonal value print and make it into something that's clear to you because there's um, there's things that play, like all of these big things, that play main character, important, big stuff rules. And then there's, oops, I should have said roles, like a character plays a role. I guess in a way it plays a visual, plays off visual rules, uh, which is that the bigger is in the front and the smaller is in the back. Normally I keep my pencil down my pen down when I'm working here but in some ways overly tracing these is going to lead to me making these two prominently the thing they are as opposed to kind of the design element that they are which is very subtle. So this is a good place to look at this upside down because upside down you can kind of squint your eyes at it and see what's important. This line here is a pretty, this dark area right here is good and one of the things is good to get correct not just a big oh I see that and sometimes it's good to take your fingers and just feel that or take a pencil and actually go over it just where it's real subtle and you feel it, feel it, feel it before you go ahead and decide what's going to happen there or 
it, you know, improperly probably like, oh, okay, that's just a hump right there. But you want to get as much of the feel for it as you can as to what's really happening. So here's another curve. Okay, here's another curve. And so you want all these curves in here. And even this, when I've got it upside down, I see this very subtle line coming down here and then splaying out into all of this foliage. So this is this kind of nuanced stuff. One of my students felt she was really done and she didn't have any of this in here. And so she had left it all white. And <clears throat> the whole piece is kind of a, a darker uh, composition in any case. So I'm going to go ahead and put this guy in. Again, get all of the subtle stuff. When I'm looking at this upside down, I see even more than I saw before. Now sometimes looking at it upside down doesn't work because you might miss like what's happening with the tiger. When I first saw this piece, I was so taken by how this tiger kind of sat in here. And uh, especially in color, he sits in here just in such a... Um, such a kind of fun way that he was easy to see, but I didn't see the back of him so much. And here's the back of him. There's a nice dark area there that'll be really important to have, and so will this. And then this is important as it comes down because it blocks his tail because his tail is going behind this thing. And this is not that easy to see. Also, the tail comes across like that, flips around, and this goes over the top of where the tail comes back underneath that. So it's good to really take a look at some of these things sometimes before you actually ink them in, you know, where you maybe you just go over them and go, hmm, is this right? And so this is what I like about this heavy marker, especially on something that's this dark. Okay, I think that we're in pretty good shape here in terms of getting most of what's happening. Um, just taking a second look at it to see if maybe I'm missing some things that'll be, that I'll wish that I had later. So I'm suggesting that a lot of this subtle stuff be created later. It doesn't have to be where people can see what it is. The main thing with this stuff and anything back behind these leaves is that it's back. And the property, shall we say, the way that back shows that it's back, and that's the most important thing, not what's back here, but that it's back here, is where it becomes very little stuff so little that you really don't necessarily know what the stuff is. And it then becomes lower contrast all in here. So we don't have any whitest whites or anything like that this, in here. And we don't have any of the darkest darks. The darkest darks are here. I'm going to make another finish deal here. Finish this. And even, we're not going to be able to make this in graphite unless we introduce some other materials as dark as this is. So you kind of want to look at it and see what you can see in here. But a lot of the work that this is doing compositionally is again not necessarily having a lot of detail in it because it's darkened. And in being darkened, it really, being big and dark, it is a huge thing for the foreground, and it's always great. The Impressionists did it all the time. They'd put some big dark thing or some big light thing in one of these two corners, which forces the viewer's eye and the viewer's pretend body to walk through the piece by avoiding this over here. I'll put this right side up for everybody else. Okay, so I'm going to put the pen away for a second um, and not get so involved in all this little stuff that should be back behind everything. And this is a new way of looking at things where you actually are thinking about what's closest to me and what's further from me and what's really far from me and maybe as in this one, what then comes back, this stuff, kind of a canopy back 
over towards me. So, um, or you, if you're the one drawing it, but in this case, it's me. So now, here's the fun stuff, is I'm just going to turn this over, and I have a um, nice line drawing that this is the back of. You'll remember that I like to write back on here, but I think you can really see that this is the back. Um, but in classrooms with 30 people, there's always some way that they flipped when they're doing their trace in place that they placed it backwards. And then it's really, really hard. When it's, when it's traced backwards, like here, I'd be having to look, if this, I were trying to fill this in or draw this in now, I'd be like, oh, what's going on over there? Because what's going on over there has to go on over here. So it's really, really important that you get your uh, orientation right. And some of the times when we just get to have so much fun just tracing around, I mean, this is, might seem, I'm going to start to back this up now. Actually, I don't want to back it up with this. I want to back it up with a piece of tracing paper and I might have to stop for a second and just grab one of my Canson pads. You can just hand that to me. I have such great help with uh, these videos. Thank you. And this is a huge piece of tracing paper. It's perfect. I'll just show that, you know, sometimes buying a big pad of tracing paper is awesome because <laughs> you can always use just part of the piece of the tracing paper. And so I'm just going to go ahead and get this piece out of here. And uh, even if you buy small pads, a lot of times I'll just take off what I need and then I'll have more to use in another little spot. And so here we are, just the right size paper for the job. It's the right size for this. Thank you. And here we are again on the back. It even says back. Maybe I should maybe I should trace this where it says back and use that for my you know lineup. In the old days with printing fabric, they'd call it the registration. But one of the things we could talk about right now is that, you know, this drawing is probably going to get put onto paper that is um, going to be a little bit bigger than what the drawing is. And so you'll want to make your corners where they are. See how I'm putting my corners onto my tracing paper. And sometimes it's really, really helpful to, let's say, you know, tape all this down right now. You know, take a piece of tape and tape it down. But one of the things that, um, in other words, tape this and this together, and that's something you could do, is um, just give yourself a little piece of tape. This is removable tape, so it's awesome. And so that'll kind of keep them together so that when you move it around to make it easier for you to trace. And I'm going to trace from this side over to that side. And that way my hand isn't going to, let's see how much junk is on my hand, not too much. My hand's not going to be touching the graphite as I go. And this is a good time to kind of use a, I'm using a 5B pencil. Uh, 6B would be great. 4B would be fine. Um, the B pencils are the softer pencils. I think of B for butter. Butter's not always soft, but if it's left out, it's soft. So these are the B pencils, and they are soft. And because they're soft graphite, they're also darker graphite than the H pencils. So you don't want to be using an H pencil and for good results using something that is softer and darker than a number two yellow pencil. Although some of those can be dark enough. They vary quite a bit. There's, it's not totally standard uh, what the number two pencil is going to do for you. Mm, so fun. And now I'm a lot less 
you know, I've got all my, I'm a lot less confused. I've got all of my decisions made about what I think the main characters are, what is closer, and I didn't, one, two, three, four, I didn't, um, those little dots, um, I didn't try to put all the background stuff in, and all the background stuff kind of lives in, in here, and I can, uh, this is like the fastest I've ever, <laughs> I think, traced. It's so easy to trace on the back of this drawing where the ink went through. Two, three, four, five little dots, and here I am, and all of this is happening right now. And this will give me a piece of paper that I can then flip on top of my good paper. One of my students last night in class said, I can't, or I guess it was yesterday morning, but anyway, I, she's like, oh, I hate, oh, this is so, what did she call it? Oh, she said it's um, so bumpy or it's so, she had a name for the texture. She said, I just don't like, you know, how this looks. I can't make it, oh, it like it's, I can't make it smooth. I can't make it smooth out. I can't make it blend out. And the thing is she'd never been on a piece of trace, a piece of drawing paper before. And drawing paper has a texture to it. It has a tooth to it. Um, the paper that I'm going to be using is Bristol paper. And I'm using the vellum and the vellum has a tooth to it, meaning it has a texture to it. And that's super awesome. Uh, I like how that works because yes, you do have little tiny, tiny dots kind of showing through what you're drawing, uh, the, yeah, what you've put down, just the tiniest amount. Now you could get on another kind of Bristol board, or we used to call them boards, but Bristol paper pad, and that would be a smooth, Bristol pad and that's more for markers where you don't want the tooth you want it to be slick and um, very smooth for the markers not to, for the markers to move quickly and also have a less porous surface so this uh, so what I like is the Bristol vellum but also a drawing paper pad that's a fairly decent drawing paper pad meaning that it's maybe 80 pound, maybe a hundred pound paper. The higher the number on the pound, then the higher, the thicker the paper. The thicker the paper, the more potential for texture, for tooth for, to be on the surface. So you, it's not something you want to obliterate, but it was so icky to her because she'd never seen it before. And, um, I like to use a lot of copy paper, you know, just it's so abundant, it's great for trying things out and doing designs on and so forth, but you have a lot more range about your texture, your surface. Um, certainly it holds a lot more, um, when there is texture, then it holds more of what you're putting onto the paper. You can do different, you know, subsequent layers and so forth and you don't exhaust kind of the potential for what the surface can hold very quickly. I mean in the most more extreme there's the texture which is more like sandpaper for drawing with pastels because the pastels will when you're layering different colors of pastels they'll not have room to continue to put more and more layers down because it just, the paper can't hold it. It's a weird idea that paper can actually hold things, but it can, and the more textured it is, the more, the more it holds it, but also the more textured it is, the more the color of the paper shows through what you're drawing on top of it. So I can't remember what she said, but she was just really beside herself because it wasn't what she's used to and that is so typical of us not necessarily of her personally but of all of us we're like oh that's the first thing I say oh this is different 
oh, we've changed something here, you know, how do I do that, you know, today we're using a couple of cameras and so I'm thinking of all of you out there in two different ways <laughs> because we're shooting from a couple of different angles today. Um, always shoot drawing free. Oops, this isn't drawing free. <laughs> Draw here now. We always shoot draw here now from above or we or from some kind of an above angle. And now we can really make it an above angle, but we're also just for fun shooting with a couple of cameras now. And you know, initially anything new, like any of this, the idea that, oh, what if we don't have every leaf? Like right here where I'm copying this, you know, I talked to you guys a little while ago about not having every leaf. I sure don't have every tooth of this tiger. I know his teeth are right here, but I'll go find out how Henri Rousseau did those teeth before I just go and put some fangs in on this tiger. Again, um, you could replace this tiger. Um, in the first part, I was replacing the tiger possibly with this dragon. <laughs> it's so fun to make stuff up. And it's so fun to have a path, to have a way in. The students are so excited by doing this drawing. This is the first time I've used this in my classes and they just are ecstatic because they know that from now on they can make up their own pictures. It's so great to color in things but it's even greater, if I might say and encourage you to try this, to be able to make up your own drawings and combine different things even if you're using images that you got out of a coloring book, you can trace them and use the parts you want. And one of the students I have, um, she is really, it's winter time right now, so I'm not seeing her tattoos, but she says she has them. So they're undercover right now under her clothing. But um, she's really used to finding images that she wants for tattoos. And then uh, tracing them or bringing them to the tattoo artist. So she's also been involved already in selecting images, but they're, in her case, they're images that she wants to put onto her body. And uh, so she said she woke up at two in the morning and just so excited. Oh my gosh, she was so excited that she had to get up and go find picture books she had of flowers and or flowers that she could see online, searching for flowers. And she then printed those and then she traced them and then she placed them in a design and in a way that she wanted on really a big sheet of paper. She really, she really used a big sheet of paper and she actually did that twice. And I said, and I bet you went right back to sleep after you were done. She said, I did because you know, this stuff relaxes you. And so you can be so excited about art that you can't sleep, but after you get up at two in the morning and make what you want, then you just sleep, sleep like you were a baby with no cares in the world because the world falls away. So you can see this takes some time, but it is worth it. And, um, Let's try to finish this out kind of quickly for you, but I'm trying to keep up the draw here now idea that we don't just whip things away from you like, ah, okay, here and here it is finished. So maybe that would have been good, but it also maybe shows you here how quickly you can draw once you've gotten your ink on the other side and gotten your ink to come through to this side. Now here's a quick way here that I might just turn this again, just turning it around. Doesn't have to stay right side up. Very exciting. Um, and gives everybody who's willing to put some time into it a way to improve their drawing skills. And I can assure you that doing this um, 
gives you a relaxed way to make something and also a relaxed way to learn how to move your pencil in all these different directions to see something and to draw right on top of it. Some curved, some straight, some tiny, some bigger, so forth. So here we are. Uh, this one's all ready now to see what happens down here. This is all ready to flip over onto. So this was the they both are going to flip. I'm going to flip both of them over and now this is going to be the front and this guy is also the front <laughs> and I'm ready to place this let's see if I've got something good here onto a slightly textured piece of Bristol paper and this is a really good time to say hey is this the tiger and is this the tiger and is this the tiger's butt and this is the butt and is this the tiger's tail? Still haven't really seen that tail as well as I really see it here in the color one. I had this color one printed too and I think it's a good idea especially when I think in the third part we're going to talk about how to work the color. But this time we're going to work just with a graphite. So now again we want to use a little piece of trace of uh, I want to use a little piece. I want to get this all kind of pushed back and just be looking at the edge of my paper. There's a whole, I, I'm almost thinking there's a whole science to making sure that you have enough room to work and you can move things around while you're working. Um, a lot of times um, my younger students have not had much experience with that. And one of the things I want to do right now is just um, move now I'm going to go to a 2H now, for eh, at least just for a second, because I just want to push these. The 2H, it's a lot harder pencil, and maybe just a number two yellow pencil would be good. Um, but you can get more pressure and move it more easily. You see how nicely these guys moved here. And what I want to do, I'm going to pick this up for a second, push it up there, reserve my little piece of tape, and then I'm going to make sure that I have ooh, um, a, a good edge to be working towards and within. In the interest of time, I'm not being too exacting with this and I didn't find my corners from the drawing uh, from the copy of the painting to be as perfect as I expect them to be, but having a nice little right triangle will make things good, I hope. <laughs> good enough. How about that? Good enough is always just one of our favorite things these days, right? Good enough. And uh, this is getting to the fourth corner. It's like, okay, that wasn't exactly that. But what is close to that is that I have this edge now. And um, that was one of the things that my students are so used to drawing to the edge of paper. And I'm used to trying to get them to understand that we can reformat our paper to be the size of whatever we're copying in this case, or whatever size we want to draw in. And that's a whole other subject, but it's a good one where we're not always drawing on the same size paper. So now I flip this over and you can see that I'm on the back. Uh, oops. Oh, yeah, I'm on the back and I'm seeing the back. Uh, the tiger's pointed this way and the tiger's pointed this way. And this back part is all loaded up. I call it loaded up with the um, graphite. So we have graphite on the front, graphite on the back, and sometimes it's good just to check. So here I am. I'm going to check up here and just make sure that this is, oops, that that's coming through. So you see that right there. It's coming through and we're all ready to go. And I am also going to use a 
so far. I might change, switch off, but I'm using a red. It could be any color, but I'm using a colored pencil. Now this is going to mess it up for being used again to, let's say, flip this later, but who cares because this is really, and again, I'm going to just check just to make sure that I'm coming through, and I am. Um, I, if I do it in red, and you can see that I kind of go back and forth. So, you know, I've talked about making sure that you're, that you just go whoop, like this when you're tracing because it's a really good thing to practice what I'm doing right there. And so wherever you can put a lot of pressure and practice that, that's good. But I also may, you may see me just go back and forth like this sometimes just to make sure that it's transferring. Now I don't want a whole lot of dark lines on the other side. Uh, you know, on the paper because, again, we're using these lines to show us where to um, put our tonal value, but we're going to go from having a tonal value drawing to copy. My, I call him my snake, but it's actually the tiger's tail is going to be going off the paper a little bit, but I think I'll go ahead or out. It's All it's doing is going out of my drawn format. We're really close, but I went ahead and, and put it all there, and maybe I'll end up putting my line or the line won't show, or we'll see what happens. All of this is practice, and but one of the things about it is it will actually make some very nice drawings and that's what I'm starting to see in my class. Um, we've worked on it for three classes and we also had a class before starting on this that had to do with the trace in place video here on draw here now the trace in place so they they had practiced that but sometimes it takes a while for the whole class to get on board with what tracing and placing is all about and how it works and sometimes you get a feeling and you might get a feeling too like oh wow how come it's not coming through the paper and stuff like that and you just got to double check and make sure that you have loaded both sides of your paper or at least the side where you want to make it go onto the the paper where you're transferring so I'm just going to keep doing this and we're going to get to the other side pretty soon. It was whispering, telling me I ain't never been no better crystal ball. the world over and then again Never come closer than the day you begin That's cause the answer you already hold There's only one place if you want to know Listen It's whispering Yeah, it's telling you Just coming in towards the end. It's pretty exciting. Getting all happy to look underneath. Um, sometimes you see me going over the lines and that's when I feel like I've missed a little bit of the black line that um, is on the other side. This is kind of cool the way this came off of the 
print uh, just because it only had lines on one side just on the back. It didn't start with a tracing on the front. So woohoo! I am <laughs> excited to see what is underneath and just pull this right off of here and there it is and that's really how it should look. It's um, gone from this to this and now I have this really light lined drawing that I can work with my graphite and what I'm going to want to do here and I'm going to show you this one. This one was done at the this one is on shinier paper and it was done at the print shop where they had this shinier paper. You might have it but this as well as, I don't want to use this anymore because it has too much of the outline on it. I want to just be looking at the actual drawing or the drawing in the tonal value, what seems like a drawing even though it was based on this painting. I want to have that right near where I'm working. And that's why it's nice to have another one of these around uh, a, that hasn't been drawn on so that you can pull this or something like it right up next to it. And if you want to work on the darkest areas first just because that will keep them dark, keep them intact because in this piece this is the biggest stuff are these dark areas. And I still want to be looking because I've got some information here that I need to look at to see what it is. It wouldn't be the end of the world here if I made this a, another divided branch or something like that. It doesn't really matter that you keep it to the same as this, but you still want to use this, what you're working from, as your guide. Now I can start doing my shading in all different ways because I do crazy shading like this sometimes. And I'll just kind of put it in the middle here. Um, I call it non-directional shading. It's basically baby scribbling and it's easy to do right here on this branch. Um, I can also start to even look on here to see areas that are a little bit lighter, which I'm seeing right in here. And sometimes the easiest for me to get right to the edge is to go along the edge. But what I want you to see here is when I do go along the edge, I don't press and make it align along the edge. I just bring my tonal value right up to the edge. So this is how you can start to work this entire drawing. And again, if I make this darker to start with, then I can eliminate these lines. I can just, in other words, no, I'm not making it really dark. I'm just making it a little bit darker than the paper is. And when I do that, these lines, even if they are, let's say, as dark as this is. Now this is a place, this comes down and it goes up here and then other pieces of foliage come on top of that. And I'm going to kind of leave those areas and uh, be able to make them again, trace these smaller parts down here and these places that right now I don't really know what they are if they aren't some of this very basic um, uh, branches and so forth. But I'm just going to get my main branches in here and then I'll be able to um, go in and put the lighter area next to it. Uh, but once I get the dark branches in, then I'm ready to go. And my lines could use some improvement. My, um, what I've got going could use some improvement here. I'm going to make this one darker so that it'll go on top of this one back behind it. So I'm going to make this darker because I'm going to need it to be darker so that I maintain what this, the shape of this branch is and then I'll put this in a little bit lighter. So remember, if you're making things dark, whatever's darkest or whatever's most forward, make it the most dark. And then make what's behind it, like this, 
lighter. Be and then I keep everything fairly light so that I can, uh, again, just kind of moving your stuff out of the way so that it's easy to uh, navigate what you're doing and push your paper around um, gently but, but firmly and put it into places that will make it just a whole lot easier for you. Now I can also see, oh no, I see what I didn't get in here, but I can kind of see it is uh, this side of the tree. Again, because it had this going over the top of it, so I've got this side of it. And then you can kind of start trying to just draw in a little bit of this foliage that comes down because it's a little bit unsure. I'm a little unsure of what's going on there. And then I see that, okay, here's the edge of my tree and it's very, very light there, this edge of this tree, and it's gonna come down to here, start seeing this, and again, using your fingers to trace, like I'm using my right hand, because I'm left hand, I'm gonna use my right hand to kind of trace over what I wanna be drawing with my left hand. And this is something that you can't do except for when you have a photograph, right? So this is all gonna be a little bit darker in here underneath this foliage, but I want to really understand the way this part of the tree comes down and how dark it is. And I'm going to do that so that my eye connects right in here, and you can see that I'm touching it here, and then goes down through these little dots that I put in here for the tracing and comes down to this tree. And there's just the tiniest, see I wouldn't have put that in before, there's the tiniest bit of light there and so I've got to actually look at it over here so that I can make it over here. And this line of light for the edge of this tree, because the edge of the tree is going to be, the tree is going to be dark over on this side. And then I have this little slip of light that comes in through here but then proceeds over here to make the edge of this lighter foliage. And so again, touching it with my right hand and drawing it with my left hand, or if you're right-handed, then it would be touching it over reversed. And I might have started over on the other side, over here, right hand, seeing what I'm drawing and then touching what I would be drawing so that I understand what it is. Coming up here and then saying, oh, what was this? Oh, these are these leaves. So I'm actually staying visually. So I'm sort of, it's a big step towards, uh, not totally ambidextrous, you can tell here, but big step towards observational drawing where I'm actually touching the photo and then feeling my way through here. Okay, so that gives you a little idea about right-handed, not as precise as I can be over here with the left hand. And so again, the low-hanging fruit, meaning the easiest stuff to find first, but again, you wanna keep your, your photo right here and keep your finger on what it is you're drawing so that you can really, really see what it is to do. And then I start to notice that I can make it a little darker here and somehow there seems to be a little bit of, this seems to be just a little tiny bit lighter right here in the, in the base of this and then a little bit darker here. So anytime I see that, and I'm seeing that also up here, a little bit darker then a little bit lighter next to that and then a little bit darker in the center. And that all hangs with stuff that you'll read in art books or maybe you already have about the core shadow and so here it is in the center of this of this trunk branch it's a branch it's practically still the trunk this guy's the trunk this guy's a branch but he's nice and big almost as big as the trunk the way this guy separates here and again I just use this scribbly kind of technique I'm using kind of a rounded pencil because I happen to have one that's rounded it doesn't have to be rounded but the rounded ones tend to not put down such marky marks okay so you kind of want to maybe keep some around that are kind of rounded 
maybe some sandpaper so you can round out something if it seems like, whoa, that would be a lot easier to draw it if I could actually just blunt this pencil. So I'm going to keep doing this for a while until I get a lot farther and I'll see you on the other side.